how we went from a, uh, a free trade area in Europe to a centralized super state because uh, we'd never accepted it if we went to the super state straight away. Indeed, but once yeah. these things are explained to people, uh, uh, most people say, yeah, well, you know, I, I, do, I do see it's possible. And that, that is at least a start. And, you know, it, it feels like the, we actually are in, in a way on the right track here. I mean, since Ireland, uh, their referendum on, on, the, on the Lisbon Treaty, I mean, that was wonderful. They voted no. It seems to be at this point, though, that they're going to ram it down our throats anyway. We'll see what's going to happen here. But uh, at, at least it feels like actually in many cases the people are very much, you know, against this centralization of power as it is right now. Would you agree on that? Oh, yes. Uh, and let, let, let's look at it in, in an even greater perspective. Um, they are um, increasingly um, feeling uh, anxious and uh, concerned about the way the world's going with a fraction of the information made available to them to see what's really going on. Even at the level of the information they get through the mainstream media, uh, people are starting to get more and more um, concerned about the way the world's going and the way, um, like I say, the fine detail of their lives is being impacted by uh, the state and local authorities. We had a guy this week um, who was fined a hundred pounds uh, by a local authority for putting a card in his own car saying it was for sale. Really? He was uh, prosecuted under a law um, uh, that stopped street trading. <laughs> um, we, we've had people fined hundreds of pounds for putting their uh, wheelie, wheelie rubbish bin out on the wrong day, hmm. um, because and, and sometimes and hours um, uh, from the right day. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary. Um, people um, are prosecuted for feeding the birds. <laughs> right, right. I mean... And what happens, Henrik, is that the newspapers, because these stories are so outrageous, some of the newspapers report them, and then the next week they'll report some more, and the next week they'll report some more. And then they'll also report that um, another story from this week that uh, a secret report has come to light uh, through the New York Times, which has uh, shown that the British authorities um, are uh, in the process of agreeing to share not only the DNA database, but all financial details, details of where British people went on the Internet and, and, and et cetera, with the CIA in America, yes, and that the yeah. European Union is uh, in the process of doing the same. Yeah. Now, they'll run that story. They'll run the story about uh, the, the, the guy selling his car and all the rest of it. What they don't do is connect the dots, because and, and, they don't seem to ask the obvious question. The speed and the breadth of the changes uh, that are mirroring what Orwell wrote about are so fast and so wide. Are you really telling me this is happening by accident? Are you really a coincidence theorist um, hmm. to that extent? Yeah. Um, but the, the, because the dots are not connected, um, people just see it as this, this random, quote, state um, imposing itself on them. But it's not that. There is a force behind it that's working through the state to create a global enslaved population right down in the end to um, not being able to think without those thoughts um, having the potential to be to be read. I mean, this technology is already um, uh, being developed. That's uh, right. Yeah, no, exactly. So, I mean, so these are the, the big, big brother issues that Mr. Davis was not going to talk about. And mm. um, I'm uh, standing in this election to do. Brilliant. And, and regarding, you know, tell us a little bit how the British system works here. Can people register then and vote for you or for, for uh, David in this case? What happens is um, the uh, British Isles is broken up into what they call constituencies. And uh, they return a member of parliament from each constituency. So uh, this by-election is happening um, in a constituency near Hull in the northeast of England, and anyone who is registered to vote in that constituency can vote for any of the candidates that are, that are standing. Um, the, anyone else in Britain can't, because it's, it's this, this single constituency that it's focused on, because this is the one that uh, Davis represents, and therefore uh, this is where he must seek re-election uh, from. And he'll win. The question is, what will the turnout be when it's... Um, not a, a um, an, 
election where the other big parties are standing. Yeah. And uh, how many votes will will, will um, people register against the Big Brother state? I hope it's uh, significant, but you never know because you know people are so um, uh, apathetic so often. Yeah. And uh, you know, as I'm saying to people, you know, one day you're going to have to look your children and grandchildren in the eyes without blinking, if you can, when they ask the question, what were you doing, mummy, daddy, granddad, grandma, when the fascist state came in that now controls every aspect of my life, what were you doing? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and um, after 20 years of this, I'll be able to give an answer without blinking, but uh, uh, so many others will, will uh, say, well, I did nothing. Hmm. Journalists in the mainstream will have to say, well, I helped it. Yeah. Politicians, oh, I voted for it. Hmm. Um, and, and uh, you know, these are the things that we're going to have to face unless we, we uh, stand up now, join together, forget the irrelevant fault lines of uh, divide and rule like race and religion and income bracket and po- uh, political persuasion and realize that this big brother st- uh, global state is not for Jewish people or uh, Islamic people or um, you know, British people or Australians or, or, or black people or, or whatever. It's not for middle class uh, or, or working class. It's for everybody. And unless we unite um, to uh, uh, challenge this and refuse to cooperate with this uh, attempt to enslave us, then that enslavement will um, naturally unfold. It's unfolded now by the hour, not even by the day. This is a crossroads. This is a crossroads that we, we really, uh, or, or even more appropriately, a fork in the road. Yeah. And if we keep going down the direction we're going now, we'll live in a global fascist state within 10 years because um, it's going so fast now, but the more you centralize power, the more power you have to centralize even quicker. So the momentum of centralization is not a constant speed. It gets faster and faster and faster. And, and, and it's that, we're in that situation now. And um, so what, it may have taken uh, 20 years to get to a point uh, that we're at now. It's going to take five or, or, or less um, to get to that same uh, distance again. And uh, in 10 years, we'll be in a global fascist state unless we, uh, we, we face uh, what we need to face now and, and join in unity to uh, resist it. Indeed. And, and uh, you know, I think that the key in this case is information and, and, if you will, kind of education in these subjects just to highlight what the heck is going on. And as you say, very important to just make the connections between all of these. You know, as you said, the reporting happens in the mainstream press, right? They're, they're reporting on it, but don't comment on it. <laughs> what needs to be done is is this comment on these subjects so people realize what the heck is going on. Because, again, people are very distracted. They're stressed for time. You know, everything is is limited, you know, and, and uh, the politicians increasingly tell us, you know, there's tons of stuff to worry about, right? The, the, the money is running out and soon there won't even be food, you know. There's, there's so we're kind of drawn down to this very kind of base and almost a primal level at this point. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, and, and it's no accident that at this time um, where they're gearing up for this final thrust to their global state, um, that they are crashing the global economy, that they are manipulating uh, food production and distribution so prices are going up and um, uh, it's becoming uh, more scarce, or at least they tell us it is. Right, right. Um, Because uh, fear um, is the greatest um, manipulator of people to give their power away, because people give their power away in fear of something to those they believe will protect them from what they fear. And it's interesting in this country uh, at the moment that we have resisted uh, through public uh, rejection and through pressure group rejection um, the introduction of uh, genetically modified food. Mm -hmm. Um, But as a result of this uh, food crisis quote that we're told about, the uh, Labour government is now saying we must look again at uh, genetically modified crops um, to overcome the food crisis problem reaction solution. And uh, so um, this is not a, a coincidence that all these things are being thrown at us at the same time because they want to create the chaos out of which they can um, 
uh, create their new order, their new world order, which is the centralized state. Oh, the world's in chaos. We've got financial crisis, food crisis, oil crisis, terrorism crisis, global warming crisis. We yeah. have to have a, a world centralized authority that can um, act and coordinate on behalf of everybody. Yeah, that's right. And uh, alongside of this, of course, um, we're getting this, this common theme that uh, I hear all the time now, international law. We need international law to overcome the international problems. Hmm. And international law is a law that everyone on the planet has to obey exactly what is necessary for a world government to uh, impose its authority. Indeed. And I mean, it's 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 incredible, this thing with the European Union as well. And we can see that uh, what's it, what this guy called a Valerie de Estang, I think. I don't know if I pronounce his last Estang, name. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he's the, basically the architect of the European uh, Constitution, the, the old one that the Dutch and the French voted out in 2005. But now he's, come, he's coming back again and said, you know, it's no problem. Just rush this through and every country should vote in the new, uh, you know, uh, basically the Lisbon Treaty. And we'll see what happens there. But what is interesting, of course, is that uh, uh, Valerie is uh, it's, is a knight of Malta, and and uh, you know we we have to make these kind of connections. Who are the people behind the scenes running this and pushing this agenda, right? Yeah. Well, Valerie de Stadistan was um, in my books from the very early days. Um, he's a uh, stalwart, um, or certainly was, of the Bilderberg Group, which is one of the uh, elites uh, strands in the web. And uh, he um, has been um, pushing for the centralization of power in Europe um, for decades uh, because he's a front man for the, for the game. Yeah. And he uh, was the, basically, as you rightly point out, the architect of the original European constitution. And I quote in my latest book, um, I quote uh, from him, from uh, documents that um, were seen by a Russian dissident who um, came to the West, um, in which um, he and David Rockefeller and um, uh, Henry Kissinger had a, a meeting with uh, Gorbachev when he was um, the uh, leader of uh, Russia. And uh, he told him, this is Valery Dishtar told Gorbachev that there was going to be a unified, um, centrally controlled um, uh, European state within, I think it was 15 years, 17 years, something like that. Hmm. Um, and so we'd better get used to it. And um, if the uh, Dutch and the French had not have voted against that constitution that was going to bring in what uh, Gustave um, uh prophesied, um, then he would have been spot on with hmm. the number of years he said at that time it would take to bring it in. Right. So they're a little bit off their... Um, uh, time scale because of the uh, Dutch and French vote and now because of the Irish vote. But as I've been saying for years, Henrik, um, there's a simple rule with this agenda for the Orwellian state. Um, the agenda does not take no for an answer. That's right. And you know when it's the agenda because even though people have rejected something and said, no, we don't want that, we're not having that, they will just keep coming back or ignoring those wishes or coming back for another vote or finding another way of getting around the opposition because the agenda is um, uh, the, uh, the thing that matters to them. Public opinion is irrelevant. It's just the thing that gets in the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's the same with, like I say, with uh, genetically modified food. It's the agenda. So they're, they're not going to just listen to public opinion uh, not wanting it. They're going to find ways to come back and come back until they get it. So, so this is why we need a unified, um, non-violent, Gandhian-type uh, mass campaign of non-cooperation with the system that's seeking to enslave us, because it's no good leaving it to politicians to represent us. I mean, I mean, they're next to bloody useless, and, and great numbers of them are deeply corrupt, and uh, smaller numbers of them are connected to this elite anyway. Right, and, and, um, and new power-hungry people come in all the time as well, right? So, I mean, in a, way, in a way, we need kind of an attitude change against how we perceive this. What, what I'm getting at is that we, we, we shouldn't believe that, okay, if we just that we beat, you know, let's say the Lisbon Treaty here now, things are going to settle down and, and we can rest again. This is almost like the, the agenda is 